Look, the subject is dark days in the UK property market. And why are they dark? Well, one of the reasons is, as we can see, interest rates have gone up again today. Bank of England put up by another half a percent. So it's uh, quite an interesting move. And Martin, did, am I right in saying it's going up again very soon, next month, maybe? Yeah, nobody could predict it, but the base rates predicted to sit at around about four and a quarter. So we will be seeing January, February, March, unfortunately. Right. And then it should stabilise after that. So it, it, it's getting there. Right, OK. So, you know, another reason is uh, inflation. Obviously, that's why we're seeing the rates rise, because they're trying to hold inflation back and stop it from getting out banned. Um, another thing is energy prices. Um, we're seeing that. I'm speaking to a lot of property people, and especially with HMOs, they are seeing that those high prices are taking big margins out of their profit. And you know, two things are happening. They're putting rents up. And so people are starting to migrate from one HMO to a different one to try and get save money. Um, we're seeing with the nurses today trying to get 19% increase in their wage packet. Very difficult. That's a massive, massive uh, increase. But there is one nurse on the radio this morning on a chat show as I was driving in somewhere today. And she said that her mortgage has gone up by uh, 300 pounds a month and her um, energy bill has gone up to nearly 200 pounds a month. So, look, it's just another classic thing. It's hitting everyone. I think 19 percent rise of anyone is a bit, um, you know, it's a bit optimistic, shall we say. But let's hope they sort it out because they do a good job. Um, but look, let's look at some some of the reports that... Um, I mean, who's not muted? Yeah. Oh, it's you. That's you, Martin. Shouting. That's all right. Um, look, some of the reports which are quite interesting. I, mean, I did read some of the comments which were put out here. The first of all, someone actually put, and I think it's worth mentioning, it said, look, it's the world great reset, in as much as, you know, the people in the, you know, the, the rich people sitting around the table at the top trying to ruin the country so they can buy and ho own everything <laughs> and uh, including your energy and everything else. It's quite interesting, but there's a lot of people talking about conspiracies in there, but um, look, interesting, the guardian and the guardian reported that last month in, no in November, 72% of properties that they sold went for below market value. Interesting stat. And that's just the Guardian, OK? Forbes turned around and said that over the last 12 months, they've seen property prices in, in general, on average, rise 12.6% this year to date, all right, from January to now. Halifax have said that in November, uh, sorry, no, in October, prices stopped raise, uh, rising and the values of houses dropped by 0.4%, but in no, in November, they dropped by 2.3%, which is a sharp percent. Think of that trend. Um, so I do like to look around and see what's going on. The uh, OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, said that between now and the autumn of 2024, we're going to see a 9% drop in house prices. What does that mean? Uh, it'd be interesting. I'm going to get some comments from Leslie and Martin with these things at the minute. And the interesting thing about energy is that they're supposed to the government put a cap on energy prices for you know residential homes from the 17th of October um, right up to the uh, 31st of March next year. Um, I've spoken to friends about this. I don't know anyone who's, who seems to have a capped energy bill. Um, Martin, do you know anyone who's got a capped bill? I no, haven't. I haven't. Well, <laughs> so no. it, it's interesting. It's supposed to be capped, saving them a thousand pounds a year. But I've asked around, asked on you know some people I know in at golf course over the last couple of weeks. I don't know a single person who's had it. Good evening, Amy. Um, so look on those figures that I've read out that it looks like. You know, mortgage rates are going up. Inflation's, you know, a little bit out of control at the minute, although it slowed down this last week. Um, Martin, where do you think the prices are? You you mentioned about base rate. Where will mortgages be? And the big question, is buy-to-let of single properties dead? 
we said this remember we we met in wimbledon once and we're talking when the debt service cover ratios came out in what 15 16 when they started a pinch everybody said the buy to let market was going to die then it didn't okay all right it came out strong so lenders know they have to lend the buy to let market accounts for now about 30 percent of the mortgages in the united kingdom right that's a lot that's massive as a percentage for the number of investors there are there all they've done at the moment is that they don't want to lend any money forever that's it okay, so the for what reason for what reason they filled the boots during covid and now so with the interest rates rising we know that the cost of funds that they're i was explaining the cost of funds first so, so that people don't get mm -hmm. muddled up with base rate the lending companies institutions they borrow money to lend money generally mm -hmm. so in the limited company market they all borrow, a bit like you guys borrow from investors. They borrow from banks or lending institutions, finance houses, clearing hedge funds, whatever it might be. But that's benchmarked against something called Sonia. So that's the value of sterling. And that, that interchange rate is the level they so the interest rates get set at what they can lend at. So what happened was when we all had a lovely bit out of COVID, it was they were borrowing money at less than 1%, 0.7%. Over the last year, that that rose to five, nearly six percent. So there was no the lenders couldn't borrow money at that level to lend money because why would you? If you borrow at five, you've got to lend at seven, right? Mm. So they shut their doors. What's the point? No one's going to take it up. Then we're just paying seven percent on debt we can't get out the door. Yeah. Now the swap rates have come back the other way. So now those the rates I've forgotten what they were, but. It, Beginning of the week, I think, with 3.6. Now they're edging down to sort of like about the base rate, basically. Mm -hmm. That means lenders have got the ability to lend again, but they filled the boots this year. They don't want to lend this year. They've done it. They've done the target. They've done it. Let's regroup in the new year. So that's why only a small batch of lenders came back. And ironically, they were the lenders that didn't write a lot of volume during, during the year anyway. So they're filling their boots now because they've offered 5% rates on, on five-year fixes. So... <laughs> with that in mind you've got to say well the all of the lenders got the capacity to come back they just haven't done it just yet so q1 next year so january through february is when you'll see the movement in the limited company market it's all been priced in because buy to let rates will be above five percent without a doubt because they're anticipating that rate to go to four percent in january right. so they'll sit there they know they can borrow the money at three 3.4 3.5 3.6 so they can lend it out at 5.6 and be happy which is right. where we were back in 2015, 16 with limited company loans anyway. Right. So the things that will get affected this year. So buy to let, yes, stress tests are so high. The reason you can't borrow the money at the moment is because they're stressing at such a high rate, probably 8.6, 9% on it. Yeah, some is out sevens, but some of the lenders have come back with what we commonly known as pay rate mm -hmm. plus a margin. So fleet, for example, Interest rate, five-year fix, 5.63. Stress it at 5.63 plus 125%. People can borrow again. Hmm. Yeah, they can do it. What, Land bail or follow. What happened, do you remember Lend Invest? They had their fallback rate. So fallback rate is after a fixed rate. It's, it's hmm. finished, period is finished. And their full, full point, uh, fallback rate uh, came out, was it at 7.98 or something? Yeah, yeah. So this is the this is the problem that a lot of the guys have got. We've always been a great advocate when late rates are low to take five year, seven year, 10 year fixes because you're not going to see these rates again. Mm -hmm. What tended to happen, you know, we weren't, we didn't really do this, but the guys took the short term two year fixes. Mm -hmm. The revert rates now, some of them are 8.34, nines. All right. So lend invest, you're right, they're up in the eights. So, but the trouble we've got at the moment is your fixed rate ends. We can't shift that debt to another lender or we can't do a product switch or transfer because, one, the rates are too high. Mm -hmm. And what you've got already, you can't afford in their eyes. So you can only borrow a small amount of money. Therefore, you can't refinance. So that's what needs to be to, needs to change. And that will slowly happen. So they haven't changed that yet at the minute? No. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys uh, that come out with uh, Kent Reliance or Precise Mortgages. 8.34 revert rate around that mark. I mean, they were probably on 3.3s, 3.6s before. It's just not, it's just not viable. Wow. But we can't even go there to do it because their their products are offering were offering. They've changed slightly now. Our um these weren't you just couldn't do them. Didn't yeah. work. 
So what are you finding with investors now? Have you got a load of investors who are stuck and are looking at unloading? Yeah, that's an, that's another conversation again. So as you know, we run the portfolio club, looking after people's portfolios, but they are now looking for their older, say, style stuff that's outside a limited company to dump them off. They tend to be the buy-to-let, single buy-to-let units at the moment, but you can foresee that maybe the multi-lets, not the HMOs, they're sort of three-bed multi-lets, mm. probably doing service accommodation, but so they'll they'll be shifted as well. Another thing is the taxation. They haven't really got to grips with the with the tax on these things, even though it's been talked about for how many years now? Yeah. And they're now finding that that's starting to bite. So they've got increased mortgage costs, they've got increased utility costs, and tax is really starting to bite. So those three factors alone will force people to to dump off stock. Mm-hmm. Right. So we are seeing that, but we, we can give you an update on that in the future because we will have a lot of stock that, w- that will be available. So. Yeah, and that that would be quite interesting because if, if if other people are geared differently, and you know, so if they were buying at sixty percent loan to value. So they could get a better rate. That could be the time to jump in and buy those. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the uh, the valuation question that you asked: Are property prices falling? That's difficult to assess at the moment. Mm-hmm. All right, very difficult because it hasn't really filtered through to the general market. The stock supply is still quite low. The number of buyers out there in this time of year is very, very low. So that you'd have to assess that in January or February, March when people start returning to buy stuff, yeah. and with the interest rates coming down, but what has been seen is it's not about how things are valued. It's the lender's appetite to lend. That is the question. This is why you've got to stay well ahead of the curve. So I know that in, in property world, you te- everybody teaches put, uh, lease options. They teach service accommodation, blah, blah, blah. But you need to know how they're going to be financed. So, for example, uh, HMOs. Traditionally, there's very few lenders doing a commercial-based valuation on an HMO. You're really limited to a couple of lending companies, Shawbrook being one of them. But the question is, are these banks going to have an appetite on the non-article four HMOs at six bed um, and below in the future? Jury's out on that one at the moment because they're very difficult to value for a valuer for a start. Yeah. So the, the thinking is, yes, they will, but they might reduce the loan to value, the amount you can drag back out. On the larger ones, you don't have to worry so much. It, it, it's funny, Martin, because uh, and and Leslie, I I think I've seen that you know in the last ten years, I've, I've definitely seen a cycle where you know ten years ago HMOs were you know the thing to do because you you know you turn a house into multiple um, rooms, you know four or five bedrooms, license it if it needed licensing, run it and make good profit. Then we mm. saw you know cheaper mortgages and people. They, I, what I saw personally, although I've got quite a few HMOs, is that they weren't as in demand. And, you know, I already started to, you know, turn some into, look to turn them into apartments and going single let. But I see this now because it's expensive to live. I think HMOs are going to come back into the market very strongly because people will go back into a single room with, with a, a shower and a, and you know, a toilet in there. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I met with a, a portfolio landlord today in Cambridge. He runs student HMOs, and he was just talking. And the, the main thing is the energy bills have tripled, and he just no longer. So what he's doing is waiting for the next uh next september to come and he's going to empty all of his units out and just rent it to a bunch of students without the bills included. Um that he can make more from that than renting out per room at the moment and he's doing at quite high prices as well by the way for here it's like you know going um his rooms are i know 800 900 quite top like top rental mark for the market here so um he's he's struggling with that as in he can't control the energy prices Mm -hmm. uh so yeah so there is a problem hmos there is a problem also with trainers teaching about rent to rent hmos in this market um, I just um, we had somebody that we were talking to today and she'd just been on this course and just we, for us we're just like don't go don't go you know in this area why don't you start off with management instead because it's just too much risk um, you can't control um, you've got this guaranteed rent yeah and you can't control your expenses at the moment 
um, it is pretty tough all the way around. A lot of people are pivoting, obviously, to service accommodation. But the problem is, is um, where if you're a landlord, when does if they want to refinance, that would be a problem a bit further up the line, won't it, Martin? Yeah, that's that's becoming a, a bit of a subject in the industry because while well, coming out of COVID, the lenders were they got on board with it because people were staying at home. That's what they thought they were, by the way. They thought that people were using service accommodation to have a weekend break away, but we all know it's used for contractors and da 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 da. People moving around. It's not only that. So then the lenders started saying, "Well, we'll support it where it's in a traditional holiday location, a bit like a holiday let." So you're sitting there going, "Okay," and now the appetite has gone completely from lending. Well, it's also there's no lending available, but the lenders that were doing it. It's still the single single asset unit. It's not the HMOs. You're not allowed to do it in HMOs at all. You know, an HMO is an HMO in their eyes. And so they're clamping down on it a little bit. And also they're worried about regulation in that sector. So they're worrying. They're f- trying to future-proof something that hasn't happened yet, <clears throat> which is really strange. But it's, it's the way lenders work. They say, Right, we've got all this service accommodation on our books. They don't don't wash their faces as buy to lets anymore. Mm. So, what do we do if they say you need licensing, or you can only do it for a number of days a year, or there's a planning class for it, or so they don't really know where this sector's going. Which I don't think anybody knows where it's going. To be fair, but well, there's another there is another <laughs> thing which I think you come on to nicely. Really, Let, let's take the HMOs because people are saying, look, how do we make more money uh in property and you know as you both rightfully said that you know there's a squeeze now there's more there's a higher interest rate to pay there's more energy and there's more tax to pay so how do you make a margin and again speaking to some of the people i speak to um there have been a couple of people recently that said what we're going to do is get an hmo and and then rent it to an organization, a charity, an association that look after, you know, uh, children in need or youth or, or uh, you know, battered women or, or something like that and have that as a source of income. So the company would take it and be the single tenant on the HMO. They would use it. They become responsible for all maintenance, all bills, and that investor now gets a clear margin without the management and everything else, which sounds great. And, um, um, you know, if you're not used to this, you're thinking, that's what I want to do. But there's a problem there, isn't there, Martin? Mm. Yeah, so (laughs) a lot of the properties never started out that way. So the lending companies that are existing, they've got already. They're unaware that that's now being let on. Let's just call it a supported living basis for now. It could be any one of those sectors. All right, so they don't know. You then go to refinance it. Now, for an investor, we're thinking, great, I've got the guaranteed rent, it's hands off, it's lovely jubbly. I go to get my product switch or transfer. The question of the lending company is, oh, what rent, what basis you got it rented on now? Still the same? And then you go, no, I've got it let to a supported living charity. The lender won't support it in nine times out of 10. So lenders that don't, Kent Reliance, Precise, Lend Invest, right? Foundation Home Loans. Um, Hampshire Trust no longer support it. You're down to the Redwoods. Shawbrook might, but they're very, very cagey on them. Fleet might, but they're very, very cagey on them. You won't get the loan to value. They, it's like they don't want to do it anymore. It's too much of a risk for them. And also the way in which they borrow money, they have to declare to. So if I was a lender investing in you, Trevor, I would say, So what basis, Trevor, are you going to lend to these people? You would tell me ASTs. You would tell me standard stuff. You wouldn't tell me it was supported living. So I would write into it. So I'm lending you the money on the basis that these are your activities. The moment that you step outside of that, you're in breach of your loan agreement with the lender. You've done it. And that's why the lenders chase you down. Hmm. Because they that loan is worth nothing to them anymore. It's it's causing a problem. You said at the beginning, um, if you were to remortgage, but if if one of these these investors said, look, I want to buy a house, I want to turn it in for a particular organisation yeah. who's going to be my single tenant, who would fund that? It's all as well. At the moment, it is down to people like Redwood Bank, Shawbrook Bank, what Fleet, sort of Fleet Might. But... Rates and loan-to-values, what would they do? 
they generally do up to 70, 75. Shawbrook are only a 70% percent loan. But look, listen, guys, that Shawbrook are shut, right? They've jammed the rates up so high they don't need to be there. They've loaded the LCVs or reduced the LCVs. They don't want business at the moment. They're quite clear. We are shut until we've cleared the backlog. End of story. So, but typically they we've done them there. We've done them with fleet mortgages as well. But then you've got to look at the contract that comes in from the provider. We've got examples. If you guys want them, then we can probably share them through Trevor and Leslie. Leslie can pour over it with her legal head. But um, if you look at them, they've written a very specific way, the way that lenders want them. So normally a supported living provider will give you a lease of some description or a commercial agreement. Yep. They are so baggy, they're untrue. Right? So then we come back and go, well, this is what the lenders will require. And then it's up to the client to do that negotiation to make it fit for purpose. But the reason the lenders are doing it is because they're protecting not only their position, but the actual landlord's position as well. So it's putting all the caveats in there to protect everybody. They don't give a toss about the supported living people, yeah, yeah. but it's to protect their position. So, but that's quite complicated. Yeah, yeah. You... And I was asked one more question with this, which is mm. interesting because they said to me, look, there's a particular organization, I won't say who, who've come in and pretty much offered two and a half, at least two and a half times the monthly rent. All right. With a contract, full maintenance, everything else. Yeah. So they said to me, Trevor, you know, would we get a commercial valuation on that? Remember, that would put the, the property probably at at least uh, mm -hmm. 70% over its bricks and mortar value. No, they won't, no. No, because a lot of these contracts, I think people think them like you're renting a shop space, so they, yeah. they're having a, attributing a value to the covenants in a lease. Yeah. Right? It's not the same. So to a lending company, they're going, great, Trevor, you've got an HMO, you've let it to supported living. We will support you in that activity, but we're valuing it as an HMO based on room rate. We don't care about your lease. If these guys fall over tomorrow or we have to kick you out, right, we don't want to rely on that lease. We want to rely on what we could let it for. Now, obviously, lenders aren't going to kick people out of immediately. They're going to be rehoused or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but the lenders don't rely on that income. The other thing you've got to remember is if somebody's offering you that much money, have a look at their books, have a look behind the scenes and do some Googling. There are a lot of companies out there that aren't fit for purpose. Yep. They have been on the news lately <laughs> as well. I think we've seen yeah. the incident down in Kent. Yeah. Um, that hasn't done that sector any good. Admittedly, that was asylum seekers at the yeah. time. However, that company linked to that event um, are on the red flag list. So right. you do need to check them out. I and mean, it's very simple. You can go onto the government website where you can check out um, the validity of these companies. But don't get drawn into an estate agent being a middleman. So the estate agent deals with the provider. So the provider provides the estate agent with a lease, which is going to be useless. And then the estate agent then sublets off you. That will not be supported by any lender in the free world anymore, apart from <laughs> Bob, who's got a bit of cash. All right. So Bob, we all know Bob, don't we? Yeah. All right. So that you've got to be very careful. I know it's that's a quick appraisal. It. It's a lot more okay. complicated than that, but it's okay. quick. Look, guys, I, I do have something for you tonight on how you know, how we should be, or one of the ways, one really good strategy, which I will be implementing um, in 2023 in January, and, I'm, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later, um, which I think is really exciting. But I'm going to come to Martin first, then Leslie. Martin, um, with the lending, how, how does an investor look now um, to, you know, if they were looking to get into property now, how are they going to do it with these rates and these products out there? How can one do it? What's the best way to do it now? Yeah, suck it up. <laughs> no, look, it, it, it is what it is. So the strategies have not changed. The way that you do it has not changed. <clears throat> the only thing that's changed is the rate. So it's the, it's the amount of money. The loan to values are pretty similar. So now when investors go into the market, doing single buy to lets today, probably not a strategy immediately that people should jump on. So they're going to have to look at the multi-income from a property. So a lot of people do still do the three bed, three bed is Trevor, the three bed HMOs or yeah. co-living space. Just yeah. don't do a lot, don't spend a lot on it, make it pretty, but they don't spend, don't do the on suites or anything like that. Yeah. So the other big challenge is where does your money come from? Yeah. Now, 
it's generally widely taught, isn't it, that you go out and find a mate or find an investor and then you use his money and you give him a return on his investment. Yeah. That is still a strategy. Is it easy? No, because a lot of the lenders don't like that sort of third party fund. So that is changing slightly. You've got to be a bit more careful how you do that. You need a lot of advice on it so you don't fall foul of the new regs that have come, yeah. come in. Using other but, people's money. Yeah, using other people's money. I mean, a lot of people now are jumping, their, their investors are jumping on the company with them. That's yeah. become a thing. That's easier for lenders to deal with because you've got a stake in the game. But those yeah. same people want their money back and then exit, which is not easy to do while you're on a five-year fixed. Yeah, yeah, no. Your okay. background's vanished. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's the wrong button. Yeah. Um, no, I agree with that. And uh, when you say regulations have changed about borrowing money, principally... It's all to do with the, the money laundering rules. So, you know, when the investor market kicked off, um, you know, 2013, 14, 15, oh, that yeah. kind of period, it was quite loose, wasn't it? People were borrowing money from anybody yeah. um, and it wasn't really being declared in the right fashion and lenders didn't really know where it came from. Now it's really nailed down. So every single lender wants to see the source of that funds. So your deposit, if you say you've got 100 grand, Mm -hmm. They want to see where it came from. And it came from a third party investor. They now want to know who is that guy? What basis have you lent on? Have you got a loan agreement? Which you generally will. And they're doing AML back checks on that person. Now that's for obvious reasons. Yeah. You know, but um, however, that's become more stringent now. But the, the stupidity is that we do it. We have to do it. The lender has to do it. And the solicitors have to do it. There's no generic system no, of not doing yet. it. Not That's yet. We can look at that'll come. That'll come. Yeah. Um, Leslie, what do you think the best way? The best way for investing now in this market. I don't think you should be putting any money in it at the moment whatsoever because everything's still up in the air. I don't think people should be buying stuff yet either, especially if, if lending rates are not have come down a bit or are not secure. Um, we actually. I use Martin, thanks to you for our refinancing. And Martin, how many deals have we pulled out of or have dropped off? Do you know? Oh my Lord. If I look at your like, record. That was supposed to go through this year. Yeah, you pulled, at least you pulled what, five, five, yeah. six, maybe? Use, yeah, and some of it was re for refinancing on our current portfolio. Um, how much is that worth that I've basically just pulled out of? roughly speaking sorry i'm putting him you're, on the spot here you're in the millions here you're in the millions leslie yeah a couple of million yeah easily it, absolutely yeah. easily i think it's yeah. probably it's past five million yeah collectively yeah. right collectively yeah yeah past five million like five to eight maybe um the reason for that is because i learned through a really hard time with my family in the last recession that you should never overstretch yourself or if you have a deal or deals that are that big you should never ever overstretch yourself if you don't have all of the money in the bank um it's it's even though we lost money because our valuation fees were like three grand some because some of it were like small small blocks of flats or bed sits yeah um and it, the, the valuation was three grand per pot because they were valued on a commercial basis so it costs more but um we lost out on on the, that money but i just didn't want to put us through any additional stress that we didn't need yeah there will be other opportunities that come up but it's re a real bad time to be stuck. So what I mean by stuck is um, if you don't, if your exit strategy, because all the numbers have sort of gone up or are calculated a little bit differently uh, compared to what how we used to calculate them in terms of your end value and the rental income, they've all changed. The criteria have all changed. So um, I didn't, yeah, so we, we pulled out. We had like literally five to eight million um, worth of deals and refinancing on the table. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> yeah, but- um, I'm bankrupt now because of you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, but there was a reason for that is because if, if the money's not coming through and it's taking, it's taking what? I literally just got a, email from Sarah from your office today um saying that we finally got a mortgage approval for something I just pulled I pulled out of not so long ago and this started like in the beginning of this year we made an offer yeah. on 
a block and we only now we got it and the, and the valuation was done early this year so it's, it's expired anyway but when yeah when you're seeing a repeat pattern of these things happening my experience and gut instinct is like I'm sorry I think we need to just slow down not put too much pressure on ourselves and pull out because um, the worst thing to do is be on a bridge or you're waiting for other financing to come through. So we were doing a refinance as well as wanting to purchase some of these units. So if they're not coming through, it'd be a very stressful situation also for the seller as well, who's waiting for you to complete. So um, yeah, so my, so my advice might not like it too much martin because it's like broker's business is don't buy anything at the moment um, <laughs> um but this is the next question how do you make money then um it was or, or what's the best way to make money in property property during these times and i actually think that there are loads of opportunities available maybe not the lenders might not like them but many opportunities available for those that I think people should be concentrating on their cash flow, by the way, more than anything, because the cost of living has gone up. Um, we're not just talking about energy prices. We're talking about your grocery bills, um, everything. Um, if you're driving a Tesla, of course, my energy bill has gone up as well <laughs> for that. But your petrol prices as well. The, the world at the moment is at um, a, an it's very unrestful. We've got still the war going on with Ukraine, Russia. We've got maybe something breaking out between Taiwan and China. That's been a lot of, a lot of, um, my family are from Taiwan originally, but my ancestors are from China. So I really hope there is no war between the two. Um, but there's a lot of things going on, um, in the world, which, um, so I believe there is a massive reset coming, but then we talk about that, but what do you do? You know, I, I think everybody needs to go out and make more money, like month to month money or day to day money. Of course, if you see a opportunity, um, you should seize it at some point if you have the funds. So if, if there is a deal going, because I think there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of landlords who might be in negative equity as well, where they've overfinanced on their properties um, over leverage and they might need a way out. But if if lenders aren't lending what they're going to do they might offer some sort of deal which i'm sure trevor will talk about because that's um sort of his his sort of pocket of expertise mm. um yeah but it's just good to share share our thoughts you know um why i pulled out I, i've really gutted by the way because there was two guest houses i really wanted to get and we've been it was on a lease option well at least a, a you know option uh to purchase but we actually had a, a date so it wasn't an option anymore as in if we entered get, gone any further in we would have been obligated to buy it by a certain date so you don't want those kind of pressures where you're not sure whether you can complete because you're reliant on a third party i.e the lender for financing so it's very dangerous i um, think you're you're really right there the amount of people we've seen that uh, no, matters not to me you know yeah, yes you do you put out the deals did it did it impact our firm financially no we're pretty well set because that's what i've learned something from 2008 and I, that's what we teach in business now but you know, we don't spend money willy-nilly right? we keep everything in the bank protect the staff that's what counts so then we look at it and go what you've done is absolutely right now what we see are people that chase the shiny penny they agree a purchase these options, say, five years ago or six years, whatever it might be, but they haven't actually thought to that point or got any information on how they're going to finance it when they get to that point of exercising it. So then they're left with a crippling decision. I haven't got any cash. I now want, I need the valuation. I've done nothing to it of the higher increased value in today's market yeah. so I can get 100% of the purchase price. In what world does that actually sound sensible? Yeah, yeah. So when you're going to a mortgage lender, so a traditional mortgage lender, they want to see you've added value. These people have done nothing. So why would the lender do it? So then they have to look at bridging. So then you get down to, well, will some bridging lenders do it? Yeah, but the amount of money you put into a bridge is substantially more than you would to a mortgage. So therefore they go out and get investor money or other money and they chuck it into the deal hoping that they can refinance out um, in six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. Now, some will, some won't. The ones that have added value stand a chance, big chance. The ones that haven't. By added value, I mean, you've taken a property, it was rubbish, you met, that's a beautiful HMO, or 
you've got planning permission to build a house in the garden or uh, you've converted it into flats or whatever it might be all right you've added value to it not i put a boiler in and painted it yeah that doesn't wash all right so but then these guys because they're chasing a shiny penny they're now predicting in their own heads what the value of that property is worth based on some lovely property that's around and the rents people are getting valuation doesn't come in so now they just about scrape out of their bridge and they can't pay their investor back mm -hmm. so that's what we call chasing it don't chase that sort of deal leslie is right in this market don't do stupid things because you might say oh i might have lost all that money you haven't lost anything because you've never had it that's you correct know? So I think you've got to think about what you've actually lost and it might be some fees for us. So it was like legal fees and valuation yeah. fees, probably not fine, but that's nothing compared to when you're, you know, going through a million plus, well, it could, it could be less than a million, you know, different amounts if you're starting out, but it's a big deal, you know, you just don't yeah. want to be overstretched because there's no certainty. Um, oh, I did have, a, I did have a question which is, um, I think Martin's also very smart, by the way. So Martin runs a brokerage and he went through a horrible time during the last recession. So this time, as he mentioned, he's got a, a, like quite a nice chunk of money, a couple of months of running expenses in the bank account. And I think that is very important if you're running a business or getting into investing as well. Um, Martin, so apart from though, eating into your pot of um, emergency funds there what else are you guys doing to increase your your business or your cash flow during you know a time where it's probably dried up a bit right so back in 2008 we were a one-trick pony we dealt with brokers and we did all their broke packaging business a massive firm did massive volume wheels came off got no money had to pay everybody off bloom so then this time around we've got this side which is what we do you know the commercial loans the other side of the business called executive wealth has got passive income running through it so we don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day running costs. It's all covered by executive wealth, right? And some. So That's very smart. So that that part of the machine works. The next stage was we recognised that a lot of the guys, probably a lot of people on this call, would go to find themselves a broker that sat in a maybe an estate agent, great residential brokers, etc., and they probably don't have the knowledge to do what you guys do so we're going to give them a packaging outlet again as a third string to the bow where we've got that will be a different it'll be the same company but it'll be a different division where they will handle those broker inquiries so what we're fed up of is people going to people like oh, actually i can't the other pack i won't mention the name so a lot of them are friends anyway but they're they're just warehouses cannon fodder and the percentage of completions is so low they charge you up front we don't charge any fees as you know leslie um but we want to do it properly mm. and that's so the, the only ones we submit will be the ones that go so that that string will go and in the future we'll be looking to acquire stuff again as well so we'll, we'll be back in the game but not just yet i've had my fill of that years ago and i don't need to do it at the moment so i don't oh. really want to do it oh, but God. you're right but interest rates now leslie are going to be five plus for a long time a long, i don't know long, they're long, long all time. over the shop weren't they like four percent at one point oh, and wait, then it went down we, and it was i remember 17 percent one day i remember that yeah like, 19, just, 1990 yeah. we went to we went to 18.5 with the halifax yeah yeah and oh, then yeah. they they banged around didn't they nines elevens tens fourteens for years and then suddenly when we got involved well as the market started to drift out in 2009 and we came out of the recession and then somebody thought it'd be a great idea to do something called quantitative easing, which <laughs> would take all the pressure. Like it was an experiment. It's about to have a mouse on a hamster to drive a light bulb. It works for a while, right? Um, so the mouse gets knackered. As soon as you withdraw it, then things have to change. And this is the reset you're seeing now. There is no propping up of the market. It is what it is. Um, interest rates should have been at 5% five years ago, three to five years ago, should have been. That's where they to prepare everybody, but they weren't. And, so we've all also, benefited from it. What's happened, Martin, to bridging bridging interest rates as well? Is has that gone up too? No. Well, some lenders who can't, some lenders have had to. So the smaller lenders, yes, yes, they have, yes. But the larger lenders, they're pretty much the same as they were before. 
yeah. they haven't really they haven't changed you don't want to be on a bridge in a recession no. if you're no. If you're, if you are, you need to make sure that you are doing everything possible to exit it with a, um, with a game plan. Um, yeah. yeah. If you know anybody who's stuck, I guess. Uh, they need to call immediately because that market's going to get really punchy. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So what's the good news then? What's the good news in these dark days? We've heard a lot. We've really chewed the cud on what's going on and you know, <laughs> I think you, you've the, good heard, news, yeah. the good news is the bloody Christmas decorations in Martin's garden. They're amazing. <laughs> oh, no, that's, yeah, hold on. That's next door. He's nicked them from next door. <laughs> that next door? I'll turn around. I'll face the tree. Look, there's the tree. No, Let's no, it's quite there. cool. It was quite cool. Right. Is that yours or next door's? That's, I think it's the whole street you get in that for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've gone to, the whole bloody place has gone to town with lights. Yeah, I know. So. Well, if someone's paying the energy, don't worry. Uh, yeah. Martin, have you managed to link your house into the local um, lamppost electric source? We're doing that. So we've got a cannabis farm down the road and you're cloaked into his. <laughs> so. Crazy. Uh. Um, no, look, what is the good news? <clears throat> oh, look, let's, let's be honest. Look, Trevor. Did it get as bad as we thought it was? No. Have house prices falling at the pace that, that the Daily Mail and Telegraph and Financial Times said they were going to? No. Have the have the rents gone down and people? No. No. Interest rate. All that happened is they went up, for, but yeah. they went up briefly as a result of Mr. Quasi. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That that was it. No confidence in the UK. Inflation ran out of control. What did we expect was going to happen? Is this as bad as 2008-9? No. Are we going to have higher interest rates going forward? Yes. Sorry, but yes. With buy-to-let market, limited company buy-to-let market will be high fours, early fives, maybe mid fives. HMO market looking like mid fives. Maybe some for, for non-commercial vowels will be down in the buy-to-let range, but generally they'll be in the, for the commercial vowels will be high five, mid fives, high fives. Some will be early sixes, but you won't bother going there anyway. Um, and the semi-commercial market will come back down from eights and nines back into the sixes again. So it's, it, look, they have to lend money. They're awash with money. They have to lend money. But um, it's whether you can put your deal together to make it work is the, and buy to let will be your biggest challenge immediately, without a doubt. How many yeah. people do you know haven't put their rents up in 10 years? Not We've got hundreds that. of them. Yeah, well, no, hundreds, hundreds of them. Hundreds, hundreds, absolutely, I know. You're absolutely right. You are. You're now right. they're trying to put them up by 10% to cover the shortfall. Well, why didn't you increase your rents every two years by 2 to 5%? Yeah. In 10 years. Oh, they're lovely. They were lovely. I've never had any problem with those tenants. Yeah, yeah. yeah not surprised. You know, you've given them a 450 rent. Well, you should be charging them 650. Yeah. They're loving you right now. Yeah. You know, they're not going to love you when you can charge 650. That's for sure. When you eventually get around to it, they'll be off. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you, look, it's a business, isn't it? No, absolutely. So look, what is the the good news? And when I started in property, um, Tripitor, I made uh, it was a friend of mine. He advised me to buy these houses uh, in Cornwall, and they were holiday lets. And the reason that uh, he said, "Look, Trevor, you must buy them. Uh, we must buy you know at least one each." And we ended up buying two each. But there is this great thing: it's a guaranteed rent for three years and a guaranteed buyback of a £25,000 profit. So we just said, fantastic. Now, at the time, my um, my close friend was a, a chartered accountant, so I thought, yeah, he must know everything about it. This is a long time ago now. And, you know, so I thought, yeah, let's do it. I had a little bit of savings, so we bought two. And I, when I bought the second one, because I thought this is such a good deal, profit every month, and we'll make 50 grand in three years. Fantastic. So the second property, I pretty much put the deposit on credit cards because I thought, well, the income of, <laughs> I know you're looking at me like that. I'm not the only one, am I? But the uh, income of the uh, rent would service that, no problem. So I thought, well, okay. And, you know, it looked all good. And so, um, you know, that looked, you know, it looked fine and away we went. Well, within the first three months, we never received a penny in rent, nothing. 
And by month six, we were down in Bodmin Court, taking this guy who and his company to court for the rent. By this time, um, you know, it was it was hard. I'd already given up my uh, high paid salary job and taken a two third salary cut to um, to do a different type of job, uh, um, community development stuff. So it really put me in a, a difficult position and it was truly sink or swim. And I think some people will find themselves in that position. However, um, I went and I did a one day course. I learned how to do purchase lease options. And I went out and I got my first one in six weeks, which paid for my training because I hadn't had training before. And from then on, I just went fairly crazy doing options all the time. Now, they're not easy. And you've got to know, understand how they work. You've got to know the numbers. Uh, it's very, very important to do that. But they are incredibly powerful and rewarding so for those of you who don't know what an option is an option is a blank sheet of paper where two people me and the owner of the property will come up with an agreement that i will buy agree to buy that property over a set number of years that might be one year it might be three years five years 10 years 20 years whatever it is for a set fee it could be a purchase price. It could even be a profit share in a percentage way in the future. And there will be a, some conditions such as um, that, you know, I can't sell it for the first three years or I can't buy it for the first three years because they've got a restriction or they've got a, um, what's that thing, um, early redemption figure on their mortgage. So there'll be those sort of conditions. But it does give me the right to buy it without the obligation to purchase it. So that's really important. So if at the end I didn't want to buy it, I could walk away. But you, I don't know anyone who's walked away because it, it doesn't make sense to walk away. Hmm. But the powerful thing is, is you get complete control of that property. Now, if you do it as a purchase lease option and replace the word lease for rent, it means that you're going to rent that property out. Neither the owner nor their family can stay in that property. It's a golden rule. You can't because it's seen as sale and rent back, and that's another regulation um, which you can't get into. But suddenly, what you're doing is you're looking at property, and if you can legally use it as service accommodation or potentially turn it into a small uh, HMO or something and do it within regulations and make sure you're getting permission from the owner who's going to check with his lender because he might have to change into a consent to let for the, the mortgage or whatever else he's got to do. But if that all goes well, it's very, very lucrative. But more than that, and this is where um, the, tomorrow I'm hoping, I'm waiting for an architect to come back. Um, we've seen some land and hopefully tomorrow we're going to be offering 3.1 million and a small profit share of the actual uh, development of part of the land uh, in the future because it's eight acres and so initially it was four but the other four if he chucks it in will give him an uplift on that so it's a little bit complicated but it could be very very lucrative and so there if we get that option if he accepts and he wants to give it to us for certain reasons I won't go into but if he gives us that and we would now go and get planning permission which would take quite a bit of money if you tens of thousands of pounds to get planning permission, all of a sudden that piece of land can become worth five, six, seven million pounds. And then I have a decision whether I go and get lending to develop it and bring in a really experienced de developer to do that, or I can sell it to a developer. So that's, that's one thing that we're doing, but let's bring it down even a, 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 a much lower notch. All right, let's supposing you start to understand this and I'm going to bring Martin in here. So Martin, let's suppose I go out tomorrow. I see this house. It's a bit run down. And I say to the guy, look, um, on, you know, you want, you called my number. I've come and had a look. What do you think it's worth? And he says, look, it's worth 240,000 pounds. And I said, well, not in the condition that's in because this is broken. I've got to put new kitchen, new bathroom. I've got to tidy it up. I've got to do a complete, I've got to invest 30,000 pounds. So if it was in good nick and, eventually we get to an agreement let's say look okay i'll have an option uh three years buy it at two hundred and twenty thousand pounds of me in three years okay 
So suppose and I now to go in and I invest thirty thousand pounds into that property, and let's suppose in we wait a little bit and we've got twelve months and let's say in that area it goes up to three hundred thousand pounds in value. All right, so it's standing me at two fifty. All right, for two twenty and thirty grand. Now, Martin, if I came to you and I said, look, there's a house I want to buy here, and I've got now a valuation of 300, which it stands up, and it's standing me at 250. Would you allow me to have a mortgage, or can you get me a mortgage where I'm basically gifting myself 50,000 pounds of, of that equity as my deposit? Now, th th this is where the caveats come in. This is we talk about today's market in the past. Anything we did in the past does not count. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So today's market, the lenders could do it on two ways. If you if you have taken that property, let's just assume it was crummy, it was falling to bits, and you spent mm -hmm. your thirty grand, and the the blender can see crummy, beautiful. All right, so they can see that there's you've enhanced it. All right, and they can see the thirty grand you put into it, and they know you're going to put your stamp into it. There are a couple of lenders that may well go against the new value. All right, and on the purchase option, so you're getting the purchase price basically one hundred percent finance roughly all right on that those figures if you haven't done that and it's you've just you might have i don't know spent a limited amount of money on it then you would have to consider bridging initially so you bridge to buy it because they'll give you the valuation not the purchase price generally and then you will re have to refinance traditionally like we used to do a bit like you buy with every finance star deal you know yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to do it that way but you still get the end result is the same it's just cost you a bit more but then you haven't put anything in yeah. So it swings and roundabouts, but there are two ways of doing it. So the guys that visibly you can see the condition change, or it's maybe it's repurposed or whatever, they stand more chance of the lender going at around about the, the new value or close to it. If you haven't done anything, they're likely to give you 75% of the purchase price plus the money that you spent on it that you can evidence. Right. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But gen yeah. generally, most people on an option, if you're going to do an option, you want to buy it, right? Yeah. If you're not, if you're going to rely on capital value increasing, which is probably a bit bonkers right now because it's going to go the other way, but when well, capital value is going going up, and then try and do it, then it's a, it's a bit like that at the moment. Okay. But you'll still get it. It's just yeah, the yeah. level of funding that you need to do. So that's that's all. Yep. Does so that let, make let, sense? I'm not sure. Perfect. but Yep. Let, let's let's take this scenario. So let's suppose you put £30,000 in and then you might want to rent it. Now, you won't remember, you don't own it. So you can't refinance that and pull your £30,000. It's, it's stuck in there. But if yeah. that's now giving you a great return, let's say you've got, you know, multiple service accommodation units in there and it's going to make you a great cash flow, then that's fine. You could do it that for the three years. And when before you can't get to the end, you would purchase that property. But with an option, you would also have it on with the contract, which is very common, assignable. Now, when it's an assignable contract, that means that although, let's suppose, uh, Omar, I, buy your, I agree to do an, an option on your house, and you agree and you give it to me for three years. I've agreed that I've got it. I have the right to buy it, but not the obligation. But once I've done the work, if there's a condition in there that I can't purchase it for the first year, that's fine. I'll wait for that. But there's nothing stopping me going to put it into the into an auction, into an estate agent and sell it. As long as I satisfy what I'm going to pay Omar, then I'm fine and I can make that profit. But we can take it so much further because it's not just purchase options. And there's a there's an awful lot. And I'll tell you a challenge which is going to come up. Um, I won't sort of release that tonight. I will set it up and we will have another call later in the year, maybe just before New Year or just first week of New Year and launch it and invite everyone if you want to come on. But let's take it in a different way. All right. And, and there are hundreds of different ways you can do options i just love them but supposing now you see a friend or someone or a house and you go to it and you say look this is amazing so a business partner of mine this is typical um he said trevor i want to sell uh, my house that i own unencumbered it's in manchester 
uh, it's worth um, about half a million pounds. He said, I want to take that and invest that with you. I said, okay, great. I said, let me go and have a look at the house. And it was an HMO. So I went to look at it. And this is where, let's supposing you see a house or a friend like this who's thinking of selling it. And I said, you can't sell this. And uh, it's a 300 year old house, big house, beautiful house. And it's on the line with other houses, terrace house, beautiful house, big, big house. But we we are now getting planning. It's going through. We tried to get four apartments, but it was turned down because of um, a certain thing at the front. They they won't allow us to dig down, do a small footwell at the front. But we tried to get four flats. It's gone back in. We will get three flats. Those three, three flats, I think it's going to cost us around about £280,000 to do it. But each flat will be worth over £350,000 in that area. So look at it now. Imagine if you had an auction and just this, just the auction on a half a million pound house, because now you're not looking at the smaller problem. You can look at any property. It doesn't matter what it costs. But supposing you know someone's got half a million. Yeah, I'm thinking of selling it in a couple of years. Well, you do an auction. You get planning permission on it. Three flats. It's now work, going to be worth a million at end value. You've got to think about who's going to do that work and they want to make a profit. But you can either do that yourself or you could um, sell it to someone. Look, Martin, in that scenario, if I had that option, all right, don't own it, and I had the option on it, so I could buy it for half a million, I can actually go and do that work under the option I've got so I could raise that money myself, not through lending because I, I don't own the property, but I could raise that money, do the works, now it's done all done and it's worth, shiny it's mm. worth well just over let's say 1.1 million and to date i've spent 700 it's, it's standing me at 780 because i've got to purchase it are you going to give me a mortgage on that yeah well because you've evidenced it Perfect. you've done it your money's in the game you know and that's that's a big con so little examples we've got the successful ones all right i don't go through them all because we do options all the time yeah, yeah. You mentioned the land, you know, land purchase is the, was when options came about, really, it was for developers, they're going around, as you rightly said, negotiating with farmers, they were then getting the uplift on the planning, the lenders would lend 100% of the purchase price for the land now, because it's got the increased value, and they whack them all the money for the development, that still happens today. So, but when you, when it moved on to housing stock, which, as we all know where it came from, but it's a very recent thing. It's very, re in, in mortgage terms, it's recent. You know, we're talking the rise of the property groups, what, 2000 and what was that, Trevor? 12 to 15? I can't really, when it yeah, really yeah. got traction. The lenders weren't really geared for these conversations. Mm. So that's why you have all these, these caveats now. So what you've just described is the perfect reason for a lender to lend to you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank it's you. when you get into territory, which is cloudy, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, then yeah. then you're, you're asking a lender to lend you above the purchase price on something you haven't done. You've got no risk, no skin in the game. You could hand the keys back next Wednesday. And what have you lost? Absolutely. So, you know, so what I've got, so this is the good news, guys. Look, I am going to be setting sorry. up a program, a six-month program starting in January. All right, I'm going to start to... Uh, build up to it. I'm going to give people information. I will do a webinar like this probably in the first week of, of January, and I will give dates when this will start. But I'm challenging myself, and I'm inviting a group to come on a small, well, it, it will be a group mentorship program for six months on options. And the goal, my goal will be to get, I want to get 15 uh, over the 12 months for me that would be my goal I don't necessarily do the small ones of two or three beds small houses you know making a, a couple of hundred pounds a month that's not what I'm looking at for me personally but I'm going to go back and get 15 for me and it, the people who would like to come on a six-month group mentorship with me for this with the challenge their challenge will be to get three to five properties with using options in six months all right. Now, it's not easy, as I promise you, it is not. But if you followed the same things that I will be doing, so I will be looking for properties as well as, as most of you guys would want to get. I will be doing a leafleting campaign, other marketing, direct uh, vendor marketing, 
some going into agents and things like this. And that's something that you'll be doing alongside me all the way through in order that six months, your goal and your challenge is to get three to five properties in those six months. Um, it is going to be, I think, quite exciting. It will be uh, we'd meet for one full day somewhere. So I will go through everything face to face. This is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to do. You'll get information. You'll be given scripts how to use it. You'll be giving role play. And so that when you are talking face to face with someone, you will know how to say that and not overload people with information and they go so blimey what are you talking about go away from me if you freak because that's what people do if you try it's true isn't it martin yeah exactly uh, so yeah. um you'd get an awful lot on the first day and then what we do we will meet once a week like this a private group and we're talking we see where the where people are having issues we talk about successes we're <laughs> failures and we'll learn together as we go through and i think it would be really exciting for six months uh, look just out of interest i'm not selling it tonight i'm just building up and we will be launching it in january who would be interested in that coming on that is anyone just so i get a feedback who would be interested just put can you put it in the chat for me that you would be interested in something like that because i think that would be uh he's been really clever she's put a hand up there bless you um but if it's in the chat that'd be cool look guys um if you've got any questions for tonight, because I really appreciate you coming on. We spent just over an hour with us. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, I'd love comments back on, on Facebook or social media about tonight. But if you've got any direct questions you want me to answer, pop it on the chat and uh, myself or you can take yourself off mute now because I've talked for long enough. Take yourself off mute. And if you've got any questions, we'll answer that before we close it down. Oh, how, how exciting though. So I told Trevor, he needs to do a challenge during these dark days to show everyone how it's done. Um, he, when, when you started in your lease options, when Trevor made the bad um, investment in Cornwall, I, I believe, I think you got, well, how was, it was over like 20 in, in a year, was it, that you secured lease option wise? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that this time round, because a lot of people that are suffering um, and, and people who want to get into property or are sort of stuck on their journey, I told Trevor he's got to up his game and go back and show show everyone how it's done. So, so his new Martin's like laughing now. <laughs> Look, I've got a great Trevor's question from Emily. Uh, so Emily has asked, you know, why would somebody uh, sell their house or their property to you on a lease option? Um, let's just establish one thing. The land and the last one that I said about turning the big house into three apartments, that is not a purchase lease option. That is a purchase option so that you take the word lease out. So I'm not renting it from them. I'm not paying them something each month. And in that scenario of a purchase option, they can stay living there and away I go because let's say there's a house that you know might sell in a couple of years and imagine it's it's half a million pounds you could pay 550 for that even a falling market it wouldn't matter you're still gonna if you sold it those three flats still making a huge thing so they can stay there all you're asking is maybe 12 months go off and get planning if you're successful buy it or 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 you know buy it and do the work and away you go you've made yourself a quarter of a million pounds in less than a year a purchase lease option, and it's a great question, Emily. Why would someone want to sell you their house on a purchase lease option and move out? Um, you typically you will find that in more difficult times when times get hard, and unfortunately, that is the time that we are coming. Look, I say this with a heavy heart, but more property, especially more millionaires, are made in tough times than they are in good times. It's a fact, uh, especially in property. I know people who are now waiting with money and they're in their words, I don't like it, but I'm waiting to clean up when it all go, you know, when people start handing their keys back because some people get into that difficulty. All right. Where they can't afford it. So imagine that. So the, the ones that I've had, I, I've had all sorts, Emily, um, from one guy that basically wanted to hand me the keys, said, mate, let's do it. Let's do it. And he went off tracking. Um, it was like uh, Vietnam, I think he went to and something else. I never saw him again. I did it for five years. 
uh, paid money uh, into his bank account. He'd signed everything, power of attorney with his solicitor. And I bought that house later on through the solicitor. But for five years, we paid him. We never saw him. So that just was something convenient. I had a, uh, other people who were going to live in another country. And, and I've had people who have moved to the north from the south. And they said, look, it's going up. I want to hold it because it's, you know, I want to benefit from that. Fine. If it's worth hundred thousand pounds today, what's it going to be worth in five years? They say, well, it'd be worth 125. Great. Let's, let's just in case, let's set the price for 95 now. And I'll give you 50% of whatever that uplift is over 95,000 pounds. Because if, if the market changed and went down, let's not have it a hundred. Let's go a little bit less. So you can now play with it. Now it's a falling market. Some people can't afford it. So imagine if you can take this property and increase the income from rental service accommodation or something, if it's in a really, you know, if it's a good spot in the area. And that's something that they will happily sign it off because they're going to go into it. Other things, husband and wife are splitting. They don't want to sell it now because they're arguing everything. I just want to get out, want someone to have it have it for 12 months, have it for two you know, two years. And sometimes they will actually fight off and you'll get, a, a, unfortunately, a good deal. In one of my options, I will tell you, I did bring a, a divorced husband and wife back together and they actually got back together and I mentored him. That's another story. But um, the last one was that there were two people. Uh, he was a, a teacher's assistant and she was a cleaner. And it was the first one that I ever did. And they moved, they bought their house. And when they bought it, they and they had three children, they realized that they were not getting any more benefits anymore. So they had to pay everything. And that was a bit crazy. Now, so they wanted to go back onto benefits. They couldn't afford to sell it at a lesser rate because their mortgage was too high. But the mortgage was serviceable. But what I said... And this is very, very important on purchase lease options. Each, the owner of the property must have, must, must have independent legal advice and independent financial advice. So I said at the time with that particular one, I said, look, I'd be happy to take your property on. However, I couldn't do it unless it, it was on interest only. It doesn't work for me otherwise. I said, but that's something you've got to go and discuss and take advice, and then you come back to me. And they went and did that, and they came back. I tell you now, that mortgage came down to £99, or £91, I think it was, a month, interest only. And my rent was £500, and I managed it myself. And that first one paid my, um, my training. But importantly, even with that, I got the owners of the property to redecorate the house, to, to change track tiles and everything else. And the day that they moved out, I had people moving in. So the thing is, um, you can never guess why. And I think I've got written down some like seven or eight uh, reasons why people move and we'll, we'll do it. But it's very much how you present it. So it's not for everyone. And I see people who get this completely wrong. They go in and say, uh, I want to buy your house in this really clever way to do it. You're going to move out. I'm going to... And they haven't got a clue. So it's not for everyone. It is like kissing frogs. You've got the other thing. So Trevor, you've got people that have got poor quality HMOs enforcement orders. You've got um, people who are elderly, who have become accidental landlords. You've got kids that have inherited property that they can't afford anymore. You've got all sorts of scenarios now that are out there that they're not the run of the mill, but they um, all exist. Yeah. You know, and, and those people want to get rid of it. Options is a great way of doing it. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, great. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Another question opportunities come up next year. Uh, uh, is it a good time to make cash property purchases with a view to finance property in six to 12 months later, once rates stabilize, locking in a lot of money. But I wonder if it, that's an opportunity to pick up on undervalued properties. Well, uh, you know, look, I'll let Martin come in a second, but um, yes, uh, look, I think buying in the next six to 12 months, honestly, because I think you are going to see a little bit of shift. Um, there's 
Martin, you you probably better than me to positioned in the way that, that I think there'd be a little run when people start getting scared of interest rates going up and up. There's this run. Oh, I just want to get rid. And um, today I had a chat with a friend of mine who was trying to sell two of his houses for cash uh, to a guy that he knew uh, who's an investor. And that person offered him. Four, uh, I tell you, the, the price of the price, he wanted about 130,000 and the guy offered to him 80,000 pounds for that house to buy. And, and that will just clear his mortgage, he told me. He said, Trevor, I can't take it. But there are going to be people in situations who are going to want to get out quick. And cash is always king. But I think it's waiting till you see those people get a little bit of a run and then you'll snap it. Martin? You're right. I mean, nothing's really changed there, has it? But it's it's. you're right. The run now is going to happen and we're going to see it from February and March. Are probably prices going to continue to go backwards? Are they? Are they? Who knows? Yeah. You know, the prediction, the predictions are that, yeah, some of the growth we've seen will get edged back. But let's be brutal about this. We wouldn't have seen that excessive growth if COVID hadn't happened. All of the things that were done and people moving. Like, I live in Swindon, guys, so it's a great metropolis of the world. <laughs> All right. I know. I've admitted that out loud, which is a <laughs> shame on me. But we've got to look at it. There were four but four and five bed houses that should have been priced at 450 to 475 selling for 650 There's no way they're worth it. You do not buy in Swindon at 650 no. All right. You buy at 450 All right. So... So that was all false. That was just a false dawn. So, but the house prices index has gone up in various areas. We know the North has had a dramatic climb, but their prices didn't really recover from the slump till what, 2019 to 2020. They got yeah. back to stable. So they saw a big jump back. Mm -hmm. So those may well go back a little bit, may well, probably more than the South. Yeah. But, so you're in a good time, but you're right. The, the biggest thing now is people will sell at a price they need to sell at. Yeah. That's that's the key to it. So you'll see more BMV below market value stuff going on. So again, for your course, if you want, I can do I can help the show how to finance this stuff and, and the lenders, the way the lenders react. To yeah, yeah. Things like BMVs, yeah, I'll get options you. or whatever. Yeah. Like if you want, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, have, I have a question. So yeah. Martin and Trevor, because you've seen a lot of lease options and done a lot of them. How um, painful are the solicitors usually in this kind of deal to deal with? As in the lenders' solicitors or the actual? Or the, uh, both, both. Both. Right. <laughs> it's not an easy ride because, again, we've seen the rise of this stuff has been in the short term. In the, in the length of sign finance has been around, it's a very short time frame where these have come out. 50, um, it's 50 years now it is yeah i know but i mean in lending terms yeah, yeah, yeah. with with the household thing so if you think about lenders solicitors they know about them and there's you know they guide the lending companies um they can be painfully slow they do understand it obviously because they're easy to understand anyway but it's the way the option agreements are written and that the lenders will look at yep. so be careful of things like having a power of attorney to yourself yeah lenders hate that absolutely loathe it yeah so that but, used to be the way they drop they pretty much drop that now yeah There's but if you're other things yeah, they can do. yeah don't do that now but but um the solicitors if you're doing uh, going to a commercial legal firm which is what you need in these environments you know, not your run-of-the-mill conveyancing they're all pretty much clued up on it um you don't get much pushback really so look, so Martin's talked about the lender side. From the owner's side, it's it's quite interesting. So look, there are quite a lot of solicitors now that will do options. And look, when I started, you were looking at four. All right, there is uh, um, Alexander's, there is MS Law, uh, and a couple of others in there, but there weren't many. But they they have grown, and. If I, again, let's suppose in, I'm going to buy uh, David's house on an option. So what I would typically do, because when I first started, some people were saying, I want my solicitor to, to do it. So I've got my solicitor who, who draws up the contract. 
and they want to go to their family solicitor. I said, that's fine, but can you go to your commercial department of your solicitor's firm, not your no normal conveyancing solicitor? Because they look at it and they don't understand it. It is a commercial agreement. So yeah. that's, that's one uh, blocker. So what I used to do, rather than go through that, because then eventually they come to yours. And I, you know, I think I lost one because they wouldn't do it. I said, oh no, there are old people. And I said, look, okay, fine. So what I would always do, I would go and I say, look, you know, I think we've got an agreement because there's a way of, of putting it out. And I would then pull out and have a list of four or five solicitors and say, look, um, if you want to choose one of these solicitors, I don't mind if you speak to each of them. If you want to choose one of those to represent you, I will pay your legal fees. Done. Really? Done. So it costs them nothing. And it's, a, it's much quicker like that, and away you go. And they can speak to them. They have that independent. So once I've done the heads of terms, I send it to my solicitor. I send it to their solicitor. And I speak to them and say, right, here's the heads of terms. I'll instruct you for them. I'll pay you. Send the invoice to me. And from that moment on, their solicitor will not speak to me. Okay? And that's how it happens. So that in the lawyer point of view, uh, no problem at all. Okay? I think there was a question further up when you first asked. Was there? Uh, I saw oh, one pop, pop, pop up somewhere. I didn't catch the name. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's see. Are they popping up? Sorry. Hi, guys. Great discussion. A quick question. Forgive me. I've done that one. Uh, appealing to buy. So I understand. It's, yep. I've done that one. No, I've done it. I've done it. Have you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I've done it. I've done all the questions. So look, it's, I think it's going to be really exciting, guys. And, you know, to go along the journey and so people can certainly share their, their, their journey. And I have to tell you, um, Winston Churchill said, every, every failure is just another step to success. And I don't think there's a true word said with options. You actually have to, and who is it that, uh, there's a wonderful book by um, Richard Fenton called Go For No. And, you know, he goes for whatever it is, 20 no's. And who's read that book? Anyone read that book? It's, uh, David, it's a good book, isn't it? Superb book, it really is. And if you have that attitude, you will be able to do options no problem at all. You've got to learn to love failure. And, and, and that's what um, Jim Rohn used to say. He said, until you learn to love failure, you'll never be success, truly successful. And so that's what options is about. And that's going to be a great journey because that means we have to get active. We have to do a lot to get results. And I like that. Uh, but just to let people know, it's not going to be easy. Like the challenge is a challenge, yeah? And like Trevor, myself, it's going to be very hard on you. So we'll be setting you some goals and um, we are going to be running around. Yep. I might set myself a goal as well, but I've got limited time to secure this option. But if I'm on the ground with you guys, might as well, right? Yep. Um, so it's not going to be easy. Uh, Trevor's got 15 to secure for next year, but he's got six more months. Like he's got the whole year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm going to do that. Some, a lot of mine would be land, but um, I will look at houses as well because I want to do stuff alongside you guys as well. Um uh, let's see. The question is: the process of a lease, a, a purchase lease option, uh, takes how many months, please? So to set it up, let's suppose in that I've agreed something. So I have a one, two, three step. There are people who teach this, and I would tell you, um, I know them personally. I've told them to get lost and get away from me, and and uh, in no uncertain terms. But there are people who will go and say, look um go into a house yep i've got the contract they've written the contract themselves with they could have just taken it and they normally fill in it and they from the stage they will say oh we'll make it five years and in the small print they've got it at 25 years they are disgusting i can tell you if you do that practice it will get chucked out in court once it's challenged it won't go through so you do need independent legal advice and they if they you change anything the other side independent legal uh, financial advice as well now the, the good thing is uh, Emily is a Leslie and my business partner and her mum is a solicitor and she actually does option agreements. So, so the, the, so the great thing is, is that uh, we'll be looking to use her services and because of our relationship, I know that it will be a lot quicker than 
the normal way because I've used just about every solicitor there is out there to use. And normally it can take weeks, let's say, you know, four to six weeks just to get the contract. And then you've got to get the other side to sign it and everything else. And remember, when people, when you have this delay, some people can go cold. You get what's called buyer remorse. That's why you never want to be too greedy. And we talk about that. There's plenty of fat in it. And if you make sure, let me ask you a question. If I can buy your house and give you more money than what it's worth, would you be interested? Well, some of us are going to be doing that. Hopefully all of us will be doing that because we're going to see where we can make more money. And by sharing that and by doing it, it's much better. So that's how you can really, you know, make this something really, really great. Um, so that's something that we'll be able to use with uh, Emily's mum, Noel, and she has contacts for the other side. So for the other side, we can recommend these other solicitors who she knows as well. So I'd like to think, I would like to think we could get them done within two to four weeks, I would like to think. Um, I'm putting my neck out a bit, but uh, Noelle's lovely, and uh, and I think she something has like a tight. That. The most important is that she has a tight control yeah. over over the deal. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so yeah. So we're very lucky to have the relationship with Noelle for this. She's working on a commercial lease for me at the moment. Um, it's going quite fast. She was, literally was messaging me during this. I said I can't come. I can't talk to you, but I'm on a Zoom, so we've just you know chatting so she's very hands-on and she works like in the evenings bless her as well because she just um really is a very good 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 solicitor yeah yeah, yeah. oh great so look guys it, you know Adi said first book i taught her to read and she still and, and she loved it i think that was go for no i can't remember uh really good and there's some great stuff out there i uh, mean 25 years qualified works around the clock and and to get deals done yeah that's uh, she, she that certainly around. does and if she, she thinks if she thinks that you've negotiated a crap deal, she will pull you up on it. Um, can tell I tell you? you can yeah. I tell you? Not every solicitor you do that. I remember um, that this uh, couple came to me and they were so pleased. And they said, "Oh, Trevor, Trevor, we've just uh, we've got these two deals uh, from this uh, owner of these two properties, and we got a lease option." And they were being trained by someone else, but I saw them at an event and I said, oh, I really don't. He said, we've got the paperwork here. I said, brilliant. I said, could you have a look at it? Said, okay, I'll have a look. So I sat down and I spent probably 15, 20 minutes at going through the numbers. And I said, run away now. And they said, what are you talking about? It's great. We've got an option. We've got an option deal. I said, run. I said, look, three years. I've just worked it out. There it is in black and white. If you have no maintenance and you'd have no voids, you're going to make 250 quid. And I said, and it's not worth the, you know, I think it was 10,000 pound profit if it got to that level at the end. So whoever produced that, it was crap because some people say, just get the deal. And that's the Holy Grail. No, you've got to make money in it. If it doesn't make money, what are you doing? Each oh. one. So when I started and I was doing them in the north, it, the, if it didn't make thirty thousand pounds, I didn't want to know. That was it. That was my ceiling. I won't do that that deal now. Okay. So you grow and you grow and you look at others. But <coughs> there we go. It's going to be fun. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that we actually it's so nice to see everyone. We haven't done a webinar for such a long time. Um, I would like. Trevor to share one more story of you guys because even though we haven't been online as much but we have been doing a lot of business and property and work behind the scenes um Trevor give them one more story because it is you know the first session back you know for a while but tell them how you saved a couple of footballers from a massive scam recently yeah I I, I can't really say too much Let, let's say um so uh, this this other company came along and let's say that they were careful let's say yeah i had to be careful here let's just say that they were a little bit um flexible on the truth and especially on numbers so you know i i seem to be a numbers person all right i wouldn't call myself particularly analytical i, I don't know if other people see me that way but i don't think i am but i am definitely a numbers person 
And I was in several meetings, went down to Brooklyn's, you know, anyone know where Brooklyn's is, you know, Mercedes and, and all of that stuff. So uh, meetings in London and looking at, uh, you know, high end deals, 25, 30 million uh, end value deals and, and even more in some of them. And, you know, there were quite a few people there. There was one guy there who was very forceful in the way that he would speak by belittling, belittling and bullying everyone in the in the room. Um, if you get to know me, you'll know one, my pet hates the bullies. It gets my back up. So, you know, I'm right in his face anyway. So that didn't go down too well with, with some, but it didn't bother me. I need to know numbers. And for, I think, six weeks, you know, they were giving, let's say, these truths, so-called truths on, on the deals and everything and saying, we need £55,000 right now for the planning, for the next stage. We need it now. We need it now. And putting pressure, I said, no, there's nothing coming over. Give me the numbers. And about six weeks, and it got a bit heated at times, they finally gave me the numbers and I and they came on. And I, I have a spreadsheet, quite a detailed spreadsheet that I went through. I said, right. I put your numbers into this spreadsheet and, and they were, I think I had seven of these guys on there. I said, these are all your numbers. These are your numbers, not mine. So let's go through them. And it turned out that a, this is on one deal. Uh, and the, the end value was 11 million and it made minus 600,000. So that meant it was going to cost 11.6 to build and that didn't have any finance costs in it whatsoever. And it was crap. And I said, you know, and they had egg on their faces. They looked really, really stupid. And to the event that I afterwards said to one of the guys, look, we do like you. We, we think we can work with you, but the others, they've binned off. We're not interested. And he stayed loyal to them. Hats off to him. But um, they went off and, and telling lies to other people. Oh, sorry, sorry, telling exaggerated truths. Um, it, but, you know, very, very convincing. You know, you know, it's going to make millions. Don't worry about the numbers. It's going to make millions. And, and it, there was very much. But the numbers don't lie. The numbers will tell you what it is. It, always. So if the numbers don't work, um, run. I also, th um, just to give everybody, I thought it was important for Trevor to share that story because if you ever feel under pressure during this time um so you're putting, having pressure because somebody wants you to close a deal want to sell something to you we, we don't sell our training like that by the way i hope i hope we don't anyway uh, i'm sure you guys would tell us off if we did but um if you feel like you're being pressurized just stay still for for a little bit or you know consider pulling it out because if someone putting so much pressure on you something is really something doesn't add up and something is wrong and especially they can't produce the numbers after you know it took them six weeks to do that that's a problem if they're looking for so uh so much investment as well yeah it, it, even with property guys if you get in to, you see a property and they say yeah yeah you can have an option on it mate you can have an option and this so so um up for it be careful we think hang on a minute let me go back and look at this property so people say should i get a survey on the property if you know nothing about property yes get a survey spend the money and find out um look i think i know quite a bit but if i i, I know enough i believe and you know uh is that i can look at it and say if there's something i'm not sure about i'm going to get a surveyor in to come and tell me all right but I will see if it's, you know, quite often I've had conversations, M Martin will smile now, when I say, Martin, got this house with a, with a bit of subsidence. <laughs> and I sent photos to him where the, the house is falling over. And what they've done, they put two rows of tiles on the roof to make it look nice because the house has moved that much. The tiles have moved apart and things like this. It's quite hilarious. But I've learned I stay away from subsided houses unless... I can knock them down, which may be the route that you take. You get the option, you work out everything, you get planning permission to do it, build flats. Maybe you can go another two stories high because the, all the planning changed last year. It's incredible what you do with the planning now with MA and ZA class and all of that. It's amazing. So, you know, it is about being wary, being wise. Do you know what, Trevor? I'm so pleased that you and Leslie haven't gone down the route for buy a property for a quid. 
Well, let right. me just explain so, what you're saying. I wouldn't even want yeah. to buy one for a quiz. Uh, yeah. okay. It can, sounds like panic. Can, can I tell you about that? All right. So my very good friend, Rick Otten, all right, is he's the guy who started um, options, but I think um, in Australia, and he did it in America and here. Now, he got fined $18 million by the Australian government for writing a book called Buy a House for a Dollar. Okay. Now, I have, I have on my YouTube channel on private an hour, about an hour and a half interview with him that tells the truth all about that story. And I did a promo video saying, guys, I've interviewed Rick. I've got all the truth about this thing. I'm going to launch it next week. Get ready for it. And he gets an email that he forwards to me saying that they've seen my YouTube that I'm going to launch. And if I do it, I'm going to be subject to international law and they're going to do me. So I, it's still sitting there in private. So when, I, when I'm gone from this earth, it will be released. But he did it. And the reason, look, the reason that it's a dollar or a pound, and that's what Martin said, is that when an auction agreement is done, the contracts have to be exchanged. Now, fortunately, we don't do blood as contracts anymore, as covenants. So what happens is that money has to exchange, and a pound is the minimum legal tender that will seal the contract. So... When you so effectively, the pound is giving me the legal contract over that property. I'm not buying it, but that's the slang that he used and got him into trouble. And just just to pipe in, the, so the basis uh, the basis of a contract is offer acceptance, intention to create legal um, relationship and consideration. So the one pound is the consideration there that would make a binding contract. No, I think. I think, guys, I was just driving out. You see all these videos where it actually indicates that you're just... I haven't got into... Hold on, I need a lawyer to drive up a, to, to go an option contract. Okay. The guy will probably want some quid. You know, they don't go into that, which I think is falsely hooking people into courses, which, yeah. you know, me and you have had this conversation many times. It's something we don't ever do. It's just... Oh, a, no. No, no. It's it, it, tell the truth. Man. It's I had... I had di dinner with Rick um, a month ago. He was passing through London. I, I went for dinner with him. And uh, he's immigrated from Australia. He's now gone. He's living in Portugal. Uh, nice, lovely guy. Really good. Very clever guy. He's doing other stuff now. Very clever guy. So, so, he got, did he, so he got an email from the Australian government saying... Yeah, they see hey, I'm going to launch okay. his story. And they said trevor please don't he said look at this email he said don't do it don't please don't because you'll be in trouble so he begged me not i said okay i won't do it <laughs> but we're good we're good mates he's a good guy i wonder what they what they would have done to you i'll discuss it with emily's mom <laughs> so it's just a legal thing i was like what can we do to you don't live there <laughs> you well, haven't well, done no, international law <laughs> you, you, you know there is international law yeah i'm, I'm you know if he, he he begged me he said trevor don't do it so i don't want you in trouble i said okay that's it. Guys, listen, it's been absolutely lovely. Thank you so much for staying on. And I really hope you enjoy it. If you can do feedback on the social media um, and watch out, we will get to launch this and to, um, you know, I'll do a launch day where I will explain everything. There will be a cost to it. And, um, you know, let us know. I will do another one of these. I, I was going to do one Sunday. I might just repeat this one Sunday. But um, I'll set another one up for the new year early new year or in between christmas and new year and so we can absolutely spend it and i'll give you the whole rundown of what we're going to get but uh, again thank you for your time tonight martin your blessing my friend and leslie no worries yes thank you so much everyone it's good to see everyone thank you everyone take care yeah take care god bless you bye. take care guys bye-bye bye-bye